On the track is a web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. And now, ladies and gentlemen, another in our musical tributes. This time, it's a tribute to the two-tone movement of the late 1970s and early 1980s. Enjoy. Bunny Rhodes nose, don't argue. Down, 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 ta down, ta down, 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 ta down, 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 down. Why must you record my phone calls? Are you planning a bootleg LP? Said you've been threatened by gangsters. Now it's you who's threatening me. Can't fight corruption with contracts. They'll use the law to commit crime. I dread, dread to think what the future will bring when we're living in real gangster time. Don't call me Scarface! It is always a good thing to celebrate our multicultural heritage, Mom. Well done to everybody involved. I really like the old credits. So, what do we have in this episode, Mr. John? Well, Hennis, we start off by visiting Canada to meet a young lady called Carol Scott, who has just published a book on the mystery animals of Oceania. Then, we go up to, well, here in fact, because Richard Muirhead's here with us again, and we're going to talk about mystery mustelids of the British Isles. I look forward to that greatly. Oh, yeah, John, I have a question. This Carol Scott, has she got any relation to Barry Scott? Who is Barry Scott? You know, from the TV, the Silly Bang guy. Bang, and the dirt is gone. Love that guy. I thought you were going to ask, was she any relation to Captain Scott, who nearly managed to be the first to the South Pole, but didn't? Or possibly Peter Scott, the great naturalist, but not some buffoon from a cleaning product advert on popular television. Really, oh, Louis. Can't, you can't, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on can't argue that more people don't know who Barry Scott is than whoever the clowns are that you just mentioned. Go on, John, get the program. OK, I want to take a poll, please. Will everybody who is in the, um, who's in the live chat in today's show, please tell us who has heard of Captain Scott, Peter Scott, or some buffoon called Barry Scott? And then we will give the answer to Louis and probably throw him into the fountain. And if you don't know what I mean by that, you obviously haven't read Bride's Head Revisited. Silly Louis. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's John Downs. I'm the director of the Centre for Fortean Zoology, and welcome to another episode of On the Track. 
This week we have my oldest friend Richard Muirhead still with us. Say hello Richard. Hello. And we are later in the show going to be talking about our long history in studying the out of place and mystery mustardids of the United Kingdom. In fact, the United Kingdom and Northern and Southern Ireland, so the British Isles. And then we're going to be doing all sorts of other stuff. But first, even before I introduce you to our first guest, I want to introduce you to Glenn Vaudry, who's going to tell us all about Weird Weekend North 2023. We've got a great lineup for 2023. The tickets are now on sale. We've got a good mix of talks, which I'm uh, happy to run through. We have uh, Claire Davy. We'll be talking about the Chase Vault and the Terror of the Tropical Tombs. The Chase Vault is the Caribbean vault where the coffins Coffin. coffins move around in a small vault. Yeah, the, where the um, the coffins move up and down and move for no apparent reason. Rob Gandhi will be talking about the Russington Horror. It's, it's in Lincolnshire, and it's um, it's a road, a varied way, but I think it's the A15. It, it's basically a very nondescript stretch of land where people have seen very strange things at the side of the road as they've been driving along. Um, a sighting that has appeared on daytime TV, or morning TV, um, of some very strange things happening uh, and being cited by motorists. I will be looking at you I... at some classic Scottish sea serpent stories so as more classic. information comes out. And we've uh, I've discovered a few more that raise questions into the look of them and a few more ideas of what people have seen in the past based on the information we have now. Uh, so we'll be updating some classics from the Victorian age into the modern world. And spoiler alert, they may not be sea serpents. <laughs> uh, Brian Hoggar will be looking at Within Walls, the archaeology of counter-witchcraft, charms that people have put in houses to stop witches getting in. Mark Ollie will be talking about crystal skulls. Um, crystal skulls found in many um, pre-Columbian sites uh, and other places around the world. And on one occasion, even Indiana Jones has had a fight with him. Steve Jones will be talking about Masonic Wicker. So uh, it'll be interesting to know. Uh, Steve Mira will be going into the UAP Advanced Studies and Project Doorway, giving us an update on what's going on there. Richard Freeman will be telling us about On the Track for the Avang Pendek. Not the little uh, fellow who does the introductions, but the actual Avang Pendek that lurks out in Sumatra. Deborah Murty will be bringing us tales from Italy with ancient witches and modern folk tales in the archaeological records of northern Italy. We have an interactive magical performance by the great Berini. That'll be well worth seeing. Uh, something slightly different for uh, next year. And David Adams' encounters with the other sides, a personal encounters of a haunting. With possibly more names to be uh, introduced. But first, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to a lady whom I have known for a long time, but never actually spoken to before, Carol Scott, who has just published a fascinating book about the mystery animals of Oceania. Well, that's what animals are for, aren't they? Yes. So, tell me, um, tell me, tell me about the book. How did you start it? Where did where did the where where did you get your interest in the subject first? Yeah. So, um, the the start of my interest in cryptozoology was actually I was on a trip with my parents, and we stopped at this kind of dingy motel uh, but they happened to be playing on the discovery channel animal x 
And I thought it was such an interesting show. I don't remember what episodes were playing, but they had me hooked immediately. And definitely, you know, just being able to learn about all these, you know, kind of weird things. And there's so much information out there. Like as a kid, I, I was very much into it. And my parents were definitely very supportive and we're always you know like look into this what what's it's actually kind of how I learned the scientific method long before I got to it in school was my my mother who has a master's um, of science you know she was like you know what what kind of evidence is this you know is, is there are there trends that you can see in you know these data points and, you know, like they, we, we traveled all over. We went to several conferences, went to uh, Point Pleasant where, you know, you know, the very famous Mothman sightings occurred. And I guess it, it the book itself had been brewing for quite a while, you know, going back to, you know, my mom teaching me about all these scientific principles and, Another thing that I noticed was that a lot of the cryptids that tend to get a lot of focus were in the, you know, Europe, North America. I mean, that does make sense. A lot of people are more interested in what's in their backyard than anything else. Um, but, you know, sometimes it was very hard to find information about lesser known cryptids. Um, basically, like the only exceptions to that were definitely the Yeti and the thylacine, mm. but I wanted to create just a giant, um, you know, <laughs> compilation of every cryptid I could find in Asia and Oceania. And some of them were more, there's a couple where it just kind of like popped into a town and, you know, everyone was like, oh, I'm so tired of this monkey that keeps terrorizing us. And some of them were so interesting that I couldn't believe that they weren't more well known in the crypto uh, cryptozoology community. So I, I, I had a really great time researching the book and writing it. And I'm, you know, I hope that it inspires people to look into some of the more, um, the lesser known cryptids that are in the book. What's your favorite? Yeah, my favorite well, the thylacine is actually my favorite animal overall. So definitely had fun writing that chapter. I definitely hope they're still out there. But I think the most interesting one was one of the chapters focused on Sri Lanka. And it was about, I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation, so I apologize. But the Netawo. And they are actually covered in Bernard Hubbleman's On the Track of Unknown Animals. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of interest after that. So I actually had to stay up very late one night and talk to a researcher in Sri Lanka about them. But for those that don't know, basically it's a legend of a hominid, a tribe of hominids or maybe like rogue tribe people. And they were terrorizing one of the main tribes on Sri Lanka and so that tribe drove them into a cave and basically suffocated them to death with fire and drove them to extinction. So that's something that was passed down for quite a while. And, you know, even by the time Bernard Hovelmans was writing about it in 1950s, 1960s, there was already like, oh yeah, I was hearing from my great grandfather <laughs> about when they killed all these uh, Netuo. And, you know, it was it was just very interesting overall and something I had never heard of. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is fascinating. I can't believe that people in the cryptozoology realm aren't talking about this. And frankly, you know, mainstream science, I, you know, it's just so interesting because um, there's not really a lot of evidence for their existence prior to the genocide. But I mean, that that's fascinating, especially having that occurrence on kind of a smaller scale. And, you know, were they animals? Were they 
you know, people? Were they like Neanderthals? Just overall so interesting. But yeah, there, there wasn't a lot to go on. And I really had to dig through old journals. Uh, the researcher I talked to was talking about how the originals um, are basically falling apart in Sri Lanka and they haven't been digitized or archived. And that's something I really wanted to bring into the book was preserving all this knowledge. Not necessarily, it doesn't have to necessarily be digitization, but even just, you know, all this knowledge that sometimes just doesn't get compiled. And, you know, like there's only that select group of people who, you know, may pass away and no one's ever going to hear those, you know, like even if they are just stories, they're still important. Um, and if they, you know, if any of the cryptids are real, then we're losing an important, some important evidence on their behavior, you know, how they work, uh, if they're, if they're extinct, just in general, anything about them. And I think that it almost forms the centerpiece of the book is just, let's preserve this knowledge. You know, maybe the ne Nieto are gone, but, you know, we could still preserve their memories. Well, that's it for Carol for this episode, but she'll be back next week. And in the meantime, you can order her book. It's called The Cryptids of Asia and Oceania, The Myths and Historical Roots of Undiscovered Creatures. And I've already read it. It's a cracker. Well, I've always been very interested in the cryptozoology of mustelids. Mustelids are, just in case you don't know, the weasel family. And they raise in, range in size from weasels all the way up to wolverines. And with such familiar creatures as otters, stoats, and badgers in the middle size bracket. Somebody who's been with me every step of the way of my investigations into mystery mustelids is my old friend Richard Muirhead. And the saga of the British mystery mustelids trundles on. And Richard got an interesting piece of news about the subject only this week. So, Richard, tell me what happened. Well, I was scrolling online and I found a report from the 8th of September this year on the Guardian website about a pine martin spotted on camera in London for the first time in more than a century. I'll just read the opening comments. A pine martin has been spotted in London for the first time in more than a century after being pictured on a camera trap installed to monitor hedgehogs. The endangered mustelid was driven to extinction in England a hundred years ago and was only sighted again for the first time in the Shropshire Hills in 2015, remaining an extremely rare animal. This particular pine martin was caught on camera in a woodland in southwest London where cameras were installed by a Zoological Society of London as part of the London Hogwatch project to monitor and conserve the capital's hedgehog population. And later on, the article speculates that the London Pine Martin originated from the New Forest 80 miles away. And that's really the substance of the story. According to Langley and Yeldon, in a paper that they wrote in 1977, the English pine martins and polecats and wildcats had been hunted to extinction before the end of the 19th century. Well, here I planned to have a look at the original citation from Langley and Yalden and find out the exact dates when they believe that the Pine Martins in London and the surrounding counties were hunted to extinction. However, 
In the intervening months between Richard Yearhead finding me a copy of this paper online and me having a look at it now on my iPad, I found that they now want to charge um, the sum of $45 for me to download it. Well, that's a lot of money, but I was prepared to do so. But here we have the scourge of the modern age, two-factor authentication. And although I have an account with Wiley, I couldn't get in. No way would they let me in. And I couldn't even ask for a new password because for some reason it won't allow authentication from my device. So, forget that for a moment. But I can say that in Devonshire they were supposed to have been hunted to extinction by the end of the 1870s. And I would imagine, just by the application of logic, that they would have been hunted to extinction in the green areas of the metropolis a decade or two before that. And Patrick Barkham, who is an author for whom I have a great deal of respect, is correct when he says that pine martins started turning up in England in about 2015. Well, they have been reported more and more and more for about eight years before that, but it was 2014 or 2015 when English nature finally admitted that there were pine martins in England. Well, that was something which Richard Muirhead and I had been claiming since the early 1990s. But never mind. What I do know is that while Richard was doing his end of our mustard investigations, he came across a whole string of putative mystery mustards. Richard, tell us about some of the mystery mustards that you've come across. I've come across a case near Warrington in Cheshire of a road killed pine martin. This was about five or ten years ago. Now this is way out of its official range. The nearest to Cheshire would be either the Welsh borders or possibly Cumbria. I've also come across a report from around about the 1940s of a type of weasel or stoat called the cane, C-A-N-E, or came, K-A-M-E, or kime, K-I-M-E. This was there was a newspaper column in a Sussex newspaper by a female folklorist. She collected all sorts of folklore, not just animal related, but all sorts of folklore. And I stumbled across, using the British newspaper archive online, this report of a stoat or a weasel that was different. I think there's something about its tail it was different from the usual stoat or weasel. Also, back in the 90s, I came across the pygmy weasel, which is a sort of folklore creature, type of weasel that, is, that was um, smaller and thinner than your usual weasel. Uh, I've come across a couple of pine martin reports from Devon in the 60s and 70s, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, I came across the story of a white mustelid, but that was very vague. I can't remember exactly where or when, just that it was picked up by a local newspaper of a large white mustelid. Um, and that's about all I can remember off the top of my head. Do you remember coming across a story called about something called the Corn Martin? Oh, the Corn Martin. Which had been re 
badly spelt and it looked like it was the Coru Martin, C-O-R-U. Yes, that was a letter I wrote to the Salisbury Journal. I picked up a story from a Salisbury, I used to live in work, Salis, near Salisbury, up until 1994 or 5. And sometime in the late 80s, early 90s, I contacted a Salisbury taxidermist and he told me about the corn martin, which, as its name suggests, lived in the vicinity of cornfields. So I wrote to the Salisbury Journal, Dear Sir, I've come across a story of a corn martin in the Salisbury area. Could any of your readers please tell me more? And they missed my letter N. I think it must have been a handwritten letter. My letter N looked like a letter U. So for it'll forever be known as a Coru Martin. And 50 years from now, if there's still a planet left, cryptozoologists will be looking for the Coru Martin. And they'll never find it, because there is no Coru Martin. It's supposed to be a Corn Martin. And, and that, I think, gives us a perfect way of ending this segment of the show. Richard and I will be back in the future talking about more about mustelids because, for example, somewhere in the havoc in the conservatory, I've got the first um, road-killed wild polecat to have been found in County Durham in something like 90 years. But at Oh, by the way, it's dead, it's road killed, and it's in a large bottle of formaldehyde, just in case you wonder why it is wandering around in my conservatory. If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page, and check out our Patreon. And as the ghost of Joe Strummer, who is an ever more regular visitor to my little studio, wants me to remind you, always press the notification bell. Otherwise, you won't be told when there's a new show to watch. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? Well, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of another episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I'd like to say a big, big thank you to my producer, Louis, and to Graham Inglis, who is the Deputy Director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, an old friend of mine, and also my carer, who looks after me now. I am rapidly approaching my dotage, and my body is packing up on me, so he has to do the stuff I used to be able to do, but which I no longer can, sadly. I'd like to say a big thank you to my guests this week, Richard Muirhead, Richard Freeman, Glenn Vaudry and Carol Scott. Thank you very much, all of you. I'll be back next Wednesday. What's happening next Wednesday? I've got no, absolutely no, absolutely no idea. But I will also be back next Saturday afternoon. And we will have the second part of my interview with Carol Scott. We will have Glenn Vaudry talking about the CFZ BHM study group and we will have other things besides. So, hopefully I'll see you on Wednesday, and even more, hopefully I'll see you next Saturday. And if you're there, I'll be seeing you. <laughs>